Hello and welcome to Big Deal. Now, as we wind down on this particular year, 2023, one of the biggest game changers has been the evolution of artificial intelligence. It's become much more pronounced in business use cases. And not just that, it's actually entered into our daily lives. What lies ahead when we talk about the technological advancement and also what are the ethical risks involved? I have luminaries with me today to discuss the way forward for artificial intelligence as we enter. 2024. Let me welcome on the show the Vice Chancellor of University of Oxford, Irene Tracy. Welcome to India, Irene. And um, we have with us Cyril Shroff, who's the managing partner at Cyril Amarchan Mangal Das. Thank you so much for joining us right here on CNBC TV 18. Now, Irene, uh, first beginning with you, under your supervision, the university is taking some cutting edge research work on artificial intelligence. Can you tell us more about it? and what is the way forward for this big game-changing technology? Yeah, well, first of all, can I just say what a pleasure it is to be back again in India. And thank you so much for the opportunity to come and, and speak with you thank this you. evening. Um, I'm very excited to share some of the work that we're doing in Oxford at the university um, that spans right from the development of the new way that we're thinking about the engineering and the algorithms that generate all the new ways that we're using AI from a sort of basic physics mathematical point of view all the way through to the ethics about how on earth are we going to live alongside these yes. amazing technologies as humans mm. in our societies and think of them as uh, sort of you know uh, helpers really in our everyday life mm. so there are many different examples of ways that we are both developing the new technologies right. but also thinking about the amazing applications that they can have you know for the betterment of us as individuals and for society right. but also some of the dangers as well and some of the worries that rightly your listeners will probably have so you beautifully set the stage for this discussion now elaborate on the use cases that you have found uh, as part of your research yeah so it's all still taking off at the moment right. but some of the areas that are really already making great traction would be maybe in the areas of medical science yes. where we're using it to look at uh, different applications to better predict who might have uh, skin cancer who might have some variants of say having been infected with covid where there might be some problems with some of the related uh, vessels and blood things mm. there's also applications in the area of um, drug design and right. prediction of new drug design yes. so the sort of chemistry that goes behind it which takes you more into the sort of outside of medicine more into sort of basic science and new chemistry new ways that we can synthesize compounds we never even thought about in our brains were possible mm. and then through to exciting things like robotic cars artificial intelligence driven cars I hear today that Tesla have withdrawn um, a lot of their cars that they've they've sent out there because of yes. the challenges of the automated driving so there's still a lot of work to do mm. if we're going to have confidence in automated cars and that's a big area of research for our team in engineering and robotic science. Right. So a whole range of different applications. Mm. We've even got some of our biologists and zoologists who are applying right. it to track animals and to be able to predict whether there are changes in migration of animals. So right. many different types of applications, I think, that would surprise people uh, as to how much one can use it as right. a very powerful tool. Oh, that's very interesting. But uh, let me uh, introduce Mr. Shroff also in this discussion. So Cyril Shroff, how do you see the dilemma going forward on using this technological breakthrough effectively and also responsibly? Uh, thanks, Nisha. That's a great question. Uh, firstly, I think we are at the early stages of the evolution of this technology. I mean, of course, artificial intelligence has been there for a long time. But in its current form with generative AI and large language models and others, I think there has been a game-changing development. And it's just been a year since we've been talking about it. Uh, but it, I think it's also brought the attention of the world on what are the opportunities, what are the pluses, and also what are the risks that are involved. Yes. I think just to elaborate on what uh, Professor Tracy said, I think the use cases are many, whether it's for healthcare, whether it's for defense, whether it's for you know, power systems, uh, financial products, there's an endless uh, supply of them. And I think life is going to be very different yes. in almost a post-AI uh, post world. But it, and there's a lot of good that it will do as well. There's a lot of innovation possible. Yeah. And I think for uh, you know, solving the world's problems, it's going to be a, a big plus. But uh, on, the, uh, on the contra side, I think there are big uh, risks as well. Mm. Uh, whilst we can sort of go into you know, a deeper discussion, I would single out two of them. Uh, 
Yes. Firstly, I think the values of technology and particularly artificial intelligence mm -hmm. are fundamentally different from human values. Yeah. Uh, and I think that disconnect, I think, is going to become sharper and sharper as we sort of go along. Mm -hmm. And whilst devising the technology, of course, you can embed some of the values, but you don't know whether the machines are going to learn it. Mm -hmm. And secondly, after some time, they're going to start developing their own values mm -hmm. uh, and create kind of nightmare scenarios as well. So it's all to be seen. I think this is one of the dilemmas and it's probably what the world is struggling at this point of time in trying to predict what will happen. That is the, I think, kind of the underlying fear that is driving regulation uh, and a desire. And it's a little bit of a kind of, you know, six blind men and an elephant uh, across the world, uh, trying, each trying to interpret it in its own way. Right. Uh, and the second big risk, apart from many others, is the bad actor risk. Hmm. So it's a it's a very powerful tool, hmm. uh, which can wreak havoc, uh, you know, wreak havoc in the uh, hands of uh, wrong people. Yes. So this is the trade-off that is consistently going to happen. As of now, it seems as if the advantages are much more than the disadvantages. But I'll stop there for this purpose. All right. Uh, do you agree? <laughs> advantages are far higher than the disadvantages at this point. I absolutely agree. Uh, I'm a scientist by background. Yes. Uh, my area of expertise is in neuroimaging and particularly pain, acute and chronic pain. Yes, and tell so us more about uh, that uh, yes. research of yours. Well, and, and so it's linked sort of to AI is, and it worries people, is that the ability to read people's brains and their mind through some of these algorithms. Yes. But still, as scientists, we tend to look at this as just an extraordinary tool. I think there's a lot of paranoia and fear out there that's been maybe slightly whipped up. Yes. And for us as scientists, we tend to think of it as just another yes. game-changing, paradigm-shifting mm. tool yes. that gives us this extraordinary opportunity mm. to start to look at data in all sorts of interesting ways. A bit like when the telescope was invented, yes. and suddenly we could look at the skies and we could see the wonder of the universe and the stars. Yes. That was game-changing. Yes. So as scientists, we tend to think of it as just this extraordinary, powerful tool. The world is rich with data. We're mm. a data-rich now globe. Mm. And our ability to mine that data and explore it and to do interesting things with it is what artificial intelligence will bring us. So I'm very much on the optimistic side. Right. I'm not naive to some of the challenges. Of course. And how we must, again, be mindful that there are some straightforward, just ethical problems with the data because the data is quite biased. Right. Now, biases in science is not unusual. Yes. But if I go back to, say, that skin cancer example yes. I gave you, often the training data will be drawn from particular demographics with particular types of colored skin, which right. means it's not going to be predictive right. for certain other ethnic groups. Right. So you have all sorts of biases that, again, we should be mindful of when we think about how we're using some of these algorithms to predict yes. what might be next. And you've right. got to be really aware of, well, what's the feeder data? Right. You know, it's very, la it's very English. The, language, the large language models mm -hmm. are very Western, yes. very, very rooted in the English language. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not going to be relevant or predictive or um, socially equitable for vast areas of the globe. Hmm. So again, recognizing where there are biases in these brings us really interesting ethical challenges. And then there's the sort of fearful end of the spectrum, which is where they start to take on an independent life form of their own. Yes. I'm not sure we'll get there, but we do need to be mindful of the bad actors. And we need to be also mindful about who's going to do the regulation. I'd be very yeah. interested to hear your thoughts on that, because at the moment, mm. the, the power and the development is very much sitting in these large corporations. Yes. And I think one of the things in our academic institutions that we're very mindful of is our yes. role and our responsibility to be maybe the better curators yes. of how we set the regulations so that, again, we're not biased and we're independent of maybe some of the directions that the corporations want to take uh, it forward. That, uh, that's exactly, that is uh, one big burning question right now, that how are we going to regulate this? It's such a dynamic technology and it's uh, really advancing very fast. Uh, so, Cyril Shroff, do you think that we have the wherewithal to regulate it at this point, and how is that discourse developing across the world first? So, Bill Clinton had famously said when the internet arrived that uh, regulating the internet is like trying to nail down jello to a wall. <laughs> and I think it's exactly the same as we speak of uh, AI as well. Yes. So, we typically come to any form of regulation from a mindset of either is it rule-based or principle-based, yes. and we bring a kind of a command and control mindset to it. Mm -hmm. I think the fear is that that is probably inadequate because mm -hmm. A, the technology is moving too fast, yes. and any conventional model of regulation is not going to apply. Mm -hmm. so even currently, we, there are kind of three trends that have emerged. There is the, the uh, executive order of President Biden uh, in the US, 
The EU has uh, legislated on it already. Yes. There are some smaller attempts that have been made both in China and Singapore. The UK has kind of, after initially kind of uh, dealing with the topic, has currently taken a hands-off approach. Uh, India is thinking it through as well. Mm. So I feel that there are going to be multiple approaches that are going to develop mm. on the regulation of this. And one of the challenges that we will face as the world is to have a common standard. Because the very nature of this technology is such is that it is not national in character. Yes. It instantly becomes universal mm. in its applicability. So how are you going to regulate this, uh, this beast, if I can call it that? Mm. Uh, but there are clearly uh, a couple of questions that stand out. One is, are you going to regulate the entity? Are you going to regulate the activity? Are you going to regulate the outcomes? Is it more a disclosure-based approach? Is it more a, uh, you know, take permission and licensing kind of approach? I think, frankly, nobody knows. Right. And I mean, each of these approaches has uh, pros and cons. Right. Uh, so, Professor, what do you think about uh, the ethics of uh, AI. Mm. Now, the biggest talking point was also the deep fakes, yes. which became even more prominent now because uh, the generative AI yep. really advanced uh, beyond proportion. Mm. So all these are becoming a menace right now. How do you foresee this particular situation? And uh, under your supervision, what yes. is the kind of research and priority that is being given to ethics in AI? It's, it's, well, we're very concerned about this, uh, you know, and I completely agree with Mr. Shroff on, on all the points that he has made. Um, and actually, um, Britain just recently held uh, a workshop to think about its, its role in regulating at Bletchley Park, which right. was where Alan Turing worked, of course, and he's, you know, considered one of the fathers of artificial intelligence, you know, with the Turing test and, and all that work, with a view to what on earth and how on earth are we going to start to regulate this uh, in the sort of British context, but also in the European context, even though we're not in Europe right now and in a global context. And I think some of these themes that you've mentioned... And India is a signatory to the Bletchley Declaration. Indeed, exactly right. So in Oxford, um, again, as I say, we've got an extraordinary breadth and depth across from our humanities, right. social sciences, medical sciences and physical sciences, with some of the leading people working in this space right, right. now. Right. Uh, in fact, most of the um, professors uh, in Britain are centred in Oxford who are developing the new engineering science. One of them is actually now head of the UK's effort around the regulation. Right. But we've also set up this centre called the Centre for AI and Ethics. Right. And this was very much um, the vision of one of our uh, donors who set up a huge new centre for humanity, Stephen Schwartzman. Mm. Uh, and so whilst we're building this enormous, wonderful building to support the humanities and really speak to the value that we have as a university to mm. look after the humanities subjects in addition right. to our medical sciences and our physical sciences. Right. He very much wanted within that centre to have a centre for the ethics of AI because mm. he could see that this was a brewing problem. Yes. So we already with the building still going up and out the ground, we've already established the centre. Yes. We have appointed about 20 people who are drawn from the philosophical and ethical background. Right. They're very much taking the more medium to long term view, a philosophical framework about how are we as individual humans and as social animals yes. going to live alongside this technology? Yes. What is the philosophical framework that we need to establish and mm. have a conversation about? And he's doing it with complete autonomy and independence mm. of, again, the large corporations mm. so that it can be standalone and yes. hopefully very helpful in terms of an advisory context to governments, right. not just in Britain, but more globally. Yes. So I think that we're really active in this space, um, yes. in that time frame. And then, of course, we have our computer scientists who are thinking in the very short term about what regulation do we need to put in tomorrow in order to make sure that we just hold this sort of um, horse that's off galloping mm. and that we make sure um, that it doesn't get to a place that we become very uncomfortable with very quickly. Mm. I should note, though, that that's not an unusual problem in science. Right. Right. I, again, I'm from the medical area, and quite often as scientists, you know, you're driven by the excitement and the curiosity of the discovery, right. and it just compels you to do that work. And quite often you discover something and then you realize, oh, I never really thought about the ethics of the implications of what I've discovered. Or, or yes. So we're not, this is not unusual or new. Yes. Um, we're better, I think, at predicting now. And I think yes. we're also better at teaching our undergraduates and our graduates who are starting their life and their journey maybe in science or maybe in some of these other areas, yes. to think about the ethical implications of their discovery research. Yes. And that's really, really important, I think, for the next generation, yes. because we're going to be you know, always and more and more, I think, accelerating um, exciting discoveries, but that will have more profound 
repercussions for society and therefore to educate our students mm. to think again beyond the boundaries of their discipline to some of the broader ethical implications will yes. be really essential and so again we'll, we'll be building that in as part of our programs. All right, I'll have to take a short uh, break on that particular note. Very interesting thoughts, but we'll have to talk about the India version of the regulations and also uh, whether scientists as well as policy makers are really working towards uh, and together towards regulating AI. So we'll talk about all those interesting topics right after this short break on Big Team.